we lose about 40% more water breathing through our mouths. So if you see people jogging too, not just for sleep, and they're like, they're just off gassing moisture. And if they were to breathe through their nose, it reclaims that moisture before it goes out, right? So it's this closed system. The dehydration associated with mouth breathing while you're sleeping. So many people have electrolyte imbalances and they have low energy and all of this. Um, the link with vasopressin and, and all of that. I mean, that was just really interesting to me. Um, you know, and, and Dr. Brahena has talked about this forever. You know, if you wake up with a dry mouth, that's a, a symptom of sleep disorder breathing. I woke up with a dry mouth as, as long as I can possibly remember. So much so that I would go to sleep with with this mm. right right by my bed every single night. Yeah. And if, even in a hotel, I'd have a big glass of water there. Mm. And I just thought that this was normal. And everyone else I was talking to had the same thing. So I said, this is how sleep is. Until you start sleep taping, you're like, right. oh my God. Yeah. I don't have to wake up with this pastiness in my mouth every night. So we lose about 40% more water breathing through our mouths. Mm. So if you see people jogging too, not just for sleep, and they're... <laughs> Like they're just off gassing moisture. Mm. And if they were to breathe through their nose, it reclaims that moisture before it goes out, right? So it's this closed system. So whether it's sleep or whether it's exercising, another reason why nasal breathing is so superior. And and Berheny has found, and, and there's also so much other research on this, looking at ADH vasopressin, which is uh, the hormone that allows us to store water when we sleep. It's why my dog can sleep. 13 hours and not wake up to ha to take a pee. This is how we do it. If we're not able to slip into to deep sleep, this isn't released properly, which is why uh, so many people get up and urinate throughout the night three or four times. I was talking to Dr. Stephen Park at Albert Einstein Medical mm -hmm. School, uh, who's done so much research into sleep apnea. And he said women who urinate more than two times a night have an increase of mortality of something like 50%. Because it's indicative that they are not reaching these deep stages of sleep where they can't. I mean, sleep is a whole other thing. You're not able to, to get rid of all the toxins. You're not able to rest and restore. And it just degrades your brain. I mean, Alzheimer's directly associated with, we could go on and on about sure. that. We know that. So I could be wrong with that 50%, but, but it's a huge percentage. And I did an interview with him months ago, and, cool. and that quote is on there. I'll definitely check that out. Yeah, he's... Um written a couple books at this point right. yeah um really interesting uh data and and so many women and men are getting up in the middle of the night to go pee and and they just attribute it to oh i'm going through menopause or yeah. i have an enlarged prostate it's just it happens so it's like it's just it's life but it's like no no it doesn't have to be that way so yeah this connection uh, it, it all goes back to this and it's an easy fix right i mean for most for most people you know mouth tape or get an appliance or if you have to get a cpap or what have you but um yeah, super fascinating. And and in the athletic space, there's a lot of people that I know a lot of power lifters and, and, and weight lifters and things, they're all on CPAPs because of the, the muscles that are enlarging their chest. And but at least they're doing something about it because before they were doing nothing. So at least they're they're doing that. Um but you know, if we can kind of wrap up with this has been an awesome conversation, by the way. Thanks for coming on. Um the the strategies of hypoventilation during exercise. Um you know, you, there's some data showing comparing athletes t doing hypoventilation techniques versus others, and they weren't doing it right, like entering in a, an episode with like half your lungs full. Can we kind of unpack that? Because I think it's practically for the athletes pretty cool. For the past 70 years, at least in, in the U.S. and the Western world, coaches have been using hypoventilation, under breathing for, for exercise. And in the 80s and 90s, some studies came out that said, oh, this is just a complete placebo effect, which, which was strange, uh, being that so many athletes got so many benefits from it. But Xavier Warren at Paris 13 University found that there were flaws in all of these studies where they were having them hypoventilate with full lungs or 50% lungs. He said the, the way that you have to do it is 50% or less. Then you really reach that stage of hypoventilation, so increase CO2 in your body. And if you do that, the benefits are profound, not only for athletic endurance. He said that it allows his athletes to pull more energy out of anaerobic states, but I've also heard it allows you to build more red blood cells, more uh, red blood cells because you're releasing more EPO. Mm -hmm. um, so it's like altitude training, but you can do it anywhere. 
where it was fascinating for me, and there's various Olympic teams who have done this and then just destroyed all the competition, and, and that's all in the book. Yeah. But you don't have to be an athlete to really benefit from this. There are so many studies right now looking into people with metabolic issues or heart issues, and you will lose more weight through hypoventilation training um, as well, and that's, that's a clear finding. That was fascinating. I think it was like 30% uh, belly fat or something in women. One of the, I was like, because I have a client that I'm working with that like we, she, her diet's dialed everything and she's not a good sleeper and she can't lose the weight. And I'm like, I want to see, I want to check out her breathing and, and maybe implement some of this hypoventilation. So I think you talked about five breaths per minute is kind of where you want to be. It, that- it depends on, on what your, your output is. So that's different if you're sitting on a couch than if you're on a treadmill or if you're really pushing into you know, zone three or whatever. You know, your, your breathing rate and your, your needs for oxygen are going to be different at those rates. So they were finding, I, I believe that study, which was about losing trunk fat, they called it trunk fat, they were using something like 13% O2 instead of, um, instead of 20%. I, I would have to look up that study. It's, it's been a while, but a, a decrease in the breathing rate. And because what this is doing, it's allowing you to build more CO2. And with more CO2, as long as you have oxygen in there, mm-hmm. vasodilation is happening. And then you're able to detach that oxygen so much more easily. And fat burns with oxygen. So, so that's what those studies were doing. 